another uh, co-president of the Bioactive Compounds Club. My name is Sam, and uh, I'm here to talk about mescaline and peyote. And uh, Ryan titled my lecture The Dessert of the Desert, so I had a little fun with paint. <laughs> <laughs> I made this guy here. So yeah, basically I'm just going to be um, talking about what, in my opinion, little research has been done with mescaline and peyote. Um, a lot of it is kind of older and I see, call it outdated, or, I guess in some terms, but there's still stuff that can be said from it, and particularly the stuff that I want to emphasize is um, anecdotal and more like philosophy. <laughs> Sorry, Phil philosophical, that's it. Yes, philosophical aspects of it. So, um, to be clear, um, a lot of people, I, I found, at least when I was talking about the lecture, didn't know much about uh, peyote or mescaline. So, peyote and San Pedro, uh, another cactus that a lot of people don't know about, are the actual cactus plants that grow in the desert environments, or in San Pedro's case, the, uh, the Andes. And so, uh, sometimes, peyote is also referred to the preparation or whatever that was taken traditionally um, as a tea, usually. And mescaline is one compound inside the cactus that's uh, an alkaloid produced by them. And it's a 3,4,5-trimethoxyphenethylamine. So I guess understanding the distinction is important. And it, that comes into play later, especially with the uh, legal aspects. So, peyote. Recently, they um, used archaeobotanical techniques so they uh, dug up some stuff, and they put it through a, uh, some gas chromatography, and they dated back um, basically through, I believe it was um, a pottery of some sort, it's like they called it paraphernalia, and they could actually find traces of mescaline in that paraphernalia that dated back to 8500 BC which, um, as I have in a later slide, actually makes peyote, at the time they did the study, one of the oldest used narcotics by uh, humans. So these are the uh, Native North American tribes that um, have all been recorded as using it. There was um, a guy who went around to uh, tons of different Native tribes, and then he asked them, what uh, plants do you use, what do you use them for, kind of thing. And um, so these tribes all um, confessed or, or said that they used uh, peyote. So the main use was uh, religious um, ceremonies, um, sacred sort of experiences, uh, spiritual visions. That was the common thing amongst all the tribes. But then I saw this one tribe, and it used it for everything. <laughs> like fever, tuberculosis, venereal disease. And so I was like, I wonder if they use it to treat peyote addiction. <laughs> Sounds like they had a case of that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so um, it may have had uh, positive effects on all these things. No one really knows. It was just sort of this guy who went around and took accounts from all these different tribes. And uh, they said, oh, we use peyote for everything. It's great. And so uh, currently, um, selective use in the U.S. Um, is allowed due to the work of the Native North American Church, which I actually had on the previous slide is uh, the Blackfoot tribe, I believe. It's because of their work that they said this is a, a sacred plant to us. The preparation is important for our religious beliefs, so you have to let us use it. Now, San Pedro is uh, one that most people don't know about. It's actually, um, it grows in the Andes. Um, they found this in um, some Chilean artifacts. I believe um, they haven't used the gas chromatography techniques that I spoke about before. What they actually, I believe they inferred it based on drawings on pottery and walls. So um, their deity was depicted as handing the cactus down to the people as sort of a sacred thing. And um, the species there refers to are the uh, Trichocara species. And the main one is uh, Trigocaris ash. And 
because of its, um, the way it's depicted, it's thought to be for the same religious use as uh, peyote. So they've done some work with um, just physiological responses to mescaline. So when they basically would just take a, a certain dose of it, inject it into an animal, and then um, see what would happen. And they found tachycardia, so fast pace of the heart, bradycardia, slowing it down, um, respiratory inhibition. I believe that was documented um, when toxic doses were administered. So breathing would slow down and then it would die. And then narrowing of blood vessels. They um, also tested it on individual muscle cells. And uh, they found, well, I believe it was actually speculated that it inhibited the release of acetylcholine um, by preventing potassium release. So what they, what the one study that I found had was that they would inject it and then they would find in the animals that there would be either um, lots of twitching or a paralysis and like collapse sort of of the animal. These were high doses as well. And they've done some research on the brain and this is a lot of what I was saying before is where I think more research is going or there's a lot more room to be done, I guess, and whether or not it will happen, I guess it's a different story. But um, it has effects on all these receptors, and the one study that I believe was the latest study that looked at um, what effects it had on the brain showed that it was an agonist and a partial uh, antagonist on the 5-H2 receptor. So what they did was they looked at how well it agonizes the receptor comparatively to 5-HT um, and as well as antagonized 5-HT compared to other 5-HT agonists. And uh, all these receptors are widespread throughout the brain and body. So I have a, a picture here of a, a 5-HT um, synapse. So you can see 5-HT goes out, it's the neurotransmitter that goes and it has these effects that allow the transmission to continue. And so, oh. <laughs> hey Chris, how do I go back? Go oh, back, back, try backspace. Like, delete. Nice. All right, so sorry, in this study, they actually um, had LSD as their um, agonist and antagonist for this receptor that they use. And so, um, in another study, the one that I looked at, um, they used the mescaline, my version in this case. And so, what mescaline does, like just sort of a brief explanation, is it stops the neurotransmitter, 5-HT, and then it also does its own thing that 5-HT normally would do. So, yeah, again, the study that um, used 5-HT and just tested basically how well 5-HT did what it was supposed to do and then tested mescaline against that. And so they found out that it's somewhere around 73%. And uh, that was actually in a really high concentration, which is um, interesting to note, compared to um, some other analogs that they use, which I'll get into later. And then um, it also had um, an antagonizing effect, which prevented 5-HD from acting. And they deemed it as low potency, again, relative to what they did. So, the other, I think the other cool part about mescaline is the other things um, inside the uh, peyote and San Pedro cactuses. So these are just in peyote, but you have these other alkaloids that the cactus produces that um, they speculate are also used for self-defense. So you have pelotine, which promotes fatigue and dizziness, hornidine, which they think is related to mescaline. It's, uh, it's in small amounts. And then you have these two, which do the same thing as pelotine and lopiforine, which um, is known for exerting its toxic effects on the vascular system. And so you have all these compounds plus mescaline, 
which they speculate are for self-defense because I, I guess I could zoom in on the cup peyote cake somehow but, and show you that the cacti are very small and relatively spineless. So, I mean, that's just a great source of water for anything strolling by, right? But the idea is that uh, an animal comes by, eats it, and then trips out and doesn't eat it again.